Vista. Hello and welcome to today's Google Hangouts entitled Video Everywhere. It's time to expand your view on visual communications. My name is Doran Youngwood. I am the Global Marketing Manager for Collaboration here at Dimension Data. And I'm joined by two of my colleagues, Jim Oldham and Steve Gage. Uh, Jim and Steve, if you'd like to uh, take the opportunity to introduce yourselves, Jim, you can start. Yes, hello, Doran. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Oldham. I'm responsible uh, for collaboration sales for Dimension Data based out of New York City. Fantastic. Thanks, Jim. And Steve, over to you. Yeah, I work with uh, Jim. We're, we're in group, uh, also based in New York, and I'm responsible for product strategy for the collaboration products. Great. Thanks, guys. So before we start this conversation, I'd like to spend just a few minutes setting some context, introducing the topic, and also explaining why, why visual communications, why video conferencing, and why now is the perfect time. So there's a well-known statistic by Harvard Research that talks about how human communication is more than 50% nonverbal. So it's the body language, it's the facial expressions that really make a difference in the way that we interact and we meet colleagues, clients, uh, even family and friends. So video conferencing is, as we, as we well know, a more um, immersive, more natural way of interactive engaging. And we also know that whilst video conferencing is certainly not a, a new technology, it's been around for a couple of decades, some of the benefits include reduction in carbon footprint, reduction in corporate travel costs, things like that. I think quite tactical benefits, but the purpose of today's call is to see if there's any more strategic benefits of video conferencing, to see what organizations are doing uh, to derive the benefits of video, uh, what are the business outcomes of video conferencing. And also today is a real rapid shift um, in pervasive video, what we call pervasive video. I know Jim and Steve will touch upon what that means to them uh, and the impact of this new wave of mobility, of cloud, and some of the new trends are impacting the way that we benefit from video conferencing. So Jim, I'd like to start with you, if you don't mind. What, what is driving this revived interest in video conferencing? Yeah, thanks, Doran. Um, I, I think to, to you know go with what you were talking about, there is a big shift in video conferencing and visual communications, and and that shift is um, if you think about it over the last you know what we used to talk about was technology focused. You know, we used to everyone would go to their clients and talk about the coolest endpoint, the fastest high definition, you know, the coolest device. Um, that whole conversation has shifted now. And, and to your point, it's it's now about the user. Everything is user centric, so uh, you know, and and that's good for all of us because it's around the experience. It's about the business outcome that we can drive for our clients instead of just talking about the technologies. So, with that said, the drivers of of why you know why are people rethinking things? And I think it's an opportune time in the market. And there's three primary drivers, if you would, or events that are dynamics, whatever you want to call it, in the market today. One is early adopters of uh, immersive telepresence, you know, in 2007, 8, 9, and 10, you know, they spent a lot of money on immersive video trying to get the best experience at the highest level of the organization. But today, there's a lot of video endpoints in infrastructure very old, very expensive to manage, and very limiting to what we just talked about, to that end-to-end -end experience and mobility, interoperability. So that's one dynamic. Secondly is all the new disruptive technologies that are out there today. So, you know, you've got, you know, Cisco, for example, has come out, you know, again, we talked about the endpoints, but, you know, it's important to some of these more immersive uh, experience. Their new IX5000 is the total cost of ownership, the experience it's done is really taking taking uh, immersive video to a new level. Then you put that in conjunction with their virtual infrastructure. You put that in conjunction with Spark and VMRs from every vendor out there. You have Econo changing changing the world uh, with their technologies on, on on several points of infrastructure. So that's the second one. The third is um, is really the new model of as a service. Every clients are really driving to adapt and, and consume these services in a way that is, is they don't want to deal with all the technology and complexities. So the as-a-service model and then also the consumption model is allowing us to share risk with our clients. That's what our clients want from us today. They want us to, they don't want us to just pay us a bunch of money and we say good luck, God bless, hope your stuff works. They want a way to consume the service 
and 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 pay for it as they use it, pay for what they use in that alignment. So those are the what I see in the market right now is really driving um, clients to rethink their vision of the experience for the users. Fantastic. So Jimmy, talk about the experience, talk about Spark, Akano, some, some fantastic solutions and, and companies out there. Um, Steve, if, I'd like to hand over to you to touch upon a bit more details around some of those trends within the technology. Yeah, so I, I think that when we see um, any major disruptions, typically a confluence of events that, that come together to allow for that. And over the last couple of years, we've seen some big shifts. The first is the move to personal devices um, from an end user perspective in terms of bringing your own device, bringing your own network, bringing your own application. Um, we've seen increased use of the internet and the expectation that the internet is available all the time, no matter where you are. Um, and we've also seen a shift in the way that end users work, the expectation that they can work in the office, out of the office, um, and, and any place that, that they're looking for. And so to, to compound what, what, what you guys were saying is there's been a shift away from room-centric um, video services towards end user based video services and the end result is that there's a client expectation or an end user expectation that they'll be able to conduct their business via collaboration, whether regardless of what client they're using, what network they're on, and, and where they are physically physically in the world. So those elements are coming together that have caused this, this fundamental shift um, in terms of how users are expecting technology to perform for them. The, um, the model that, that the industry seems to be coalescing around is what I term the, the meet me paradigm, right? So as opposed to end users dialing each other uh, especially in a multi-point call, um, dialing into a common bridge, right? So as opposed to me having to know, Dorn, where you are, or Jim, where you are, I'm like, okay, 10 minutes, meet me in my room, it's over here, and every endpoint is dialing that room, right? Um, the other major uh, impact that's happened is, is that the tech, there's been a shift in the technology to allow for the proliferation of, um, of this model. And... That's happened in a, in a couple of major areas. The first is is that as Intel-based platforms have continued to emerge uh, following Moore's law, the computer servers today are capable of running uh, processes for video collaboration that up to a few years ago or a few months ago could only be run on specialized appliances that were, were very data-centric savvy um, or data-centric data focused. So we've seen the, the crossover point now to where Intel-based platforms running in data centers following the cloud model is where a lot of these technologies are, are running on. Um, we've also seen, since the, um, the Cisco purchase of Tamburk, we've seen the, the growth of a new industry of players in the market that had a, uh, a clean slate or a greenfield slate to design products. And so we've seen uh, a new suite of products from companies such as Econo and Pexip that did not have a legacy base that they had to cater to, and they've redesigned or designed their platforms um, from scratch without limitations of having to support legacy customers. The other elements, um, we've also seen convergence of voice and video, right? So as Cisco um, has started to bring together those worlds, customers are, are starting to see that video and voice are no longer a silo. It's just they think of collaboration um, as a technology. Um, and then lastly, with all these factors coming together, service providers and others are now able to uh, provide these services on a more consumptive basis in the cloud. Right? There's been a big shift away from where previously the focus on collaboration infrastructure spend was all on hardware, and today with the fact that the hardware piece is a much smaller element based on the fact that it's Intel-based or com compute-based, now the focus on software licensing, um, which allows service providers and others to provide these services on a, on a more consumptive basis. So all these factors are coming together, users are demanding these types of services, and at the same time the technology is able to meet them, and those, those events come together to allow for a technology to be disruptive. Fantastic. Thanks, Steve. So you mentioned a really interesting point around cloud. And it's, it's difficult these days to, uh, to open a, uh, a technology publication or to go online and not read something about cloud. It impacts uh, many parts of our, our corporate lives as well as our personal lives. You know, for example, using Dropbox, which is a, a very popular tool at home. Um, cloud is obviously transforming the way that organizations deploy and manage many technologies. 
But specifically within video conferencing, I hear a lot about video as a service, as a way to turn a relatively niche communication tool into a very much a, a mainstream communication tool. Jim, can you elaborate a bit about some of the advantages of video as a service? Yeah, so Steve talked about all the various technologies, you know, that can play a part or not in a video as a service offering. So I, I think of the video as a service or video conferencing as a service offering as a, kind of a, a wrap around an eco, your video enterprise ecosystem, right? It, it's a way for us to take te technology um, based on a, on a vision and an experience that a client wants to create um, and marry that with a set of commercials and, and um, as a service models that consumption models that the client wants. And we put all that together in a package for the client so that they don't have to worry about the technology as much. They have to worry about how do they conduct their business using this technology. Um, so that wrap includes, you know, the, the, the hardware, you know, the software, um, all the service wraps, whether it's maintenance, whether it's the managed service concierge, and it brings all that together in, in, in a single service. Um, the ability to, to wrap that and deliver that consistently is obviously the key to making that successful. Um, let me let me use an example for uh, Unilever, who's you know a case study that we can talk about. Um, Unilever is um, you know one of the largest consumer companies you know on the planet, consumer products companies on the planet. They sell products in 190 countries. Their annual revenues are about 50 billion dollars annually. Um, they have 173,000 people within the company today. Um, they're responsible for 400 household brands that we all use every day in our homes. Um, Unilever, you know, came to Dimension Data. Well, first of all, they've been an early adopter of, of video technologies back in 2007, 2008 with Telerus Immersive Systems, but it was an island of, of video. And then they came to Dimension Data um, over the last you know, probably two years ago and said, all right, now we want to take this to a new level to support our vision of a true agile work environment globally for Unilever, to take that to another level. And the, the, the foundational principles of what they wanted to do, they want to be able to have employees be able to work from anywhere, anytime, no matter what. As long as they could conduct their business, they didn't care where they were at. So that's one of their missions. The other was to um, create a workspaces around activities, not around individuals. So, you know, people used to have big offices and pictures and all this. This is my office. This is my... No, they, they want to create an environment where people are now um, working, um, you know, wherever they need to, whenever they need to. So a space is a space for a purpose-built environment. Uh, and then, then finally, they want to make sure that the technology, the third principle was the technology has to be able to enable them in a mobile um, environment, but also to be able to do advanced collaboration, you know, presentations or even product information, collaborate real time. So those are the three founding uh, goals that they have of this agile work environment. So what Dimension Data, what we've done is provide, as I described, a video conference as video conferencing as a service model, where um, Dimension Data actually owns all the equipment, all the endpoints. Um, all the services, everything they provide, and they bill back to Unilever on a single monthly bill for all those services. But what they're doing is enabling the company end-to-end -to, -end to be able to work anywhere, anytime, and communicate across um, all the various uh, business units um, with their partners um, using whatever technology. The platform included not only the immersive video, not only the 400 room, room systems, around the world, uh, but it also allows them to interoperate with 30,000 link users um, at Unilever across that entire platform. So that video as a service is one service from Dimension Data, the way that Unilever envisions their user experience, and we deliver that every day for them. It sounds fantastic, especially the interoperability. They're bringing the two worlds together of, of Cisco and Microsoft, Link, or Skype for Business, very much needed in this day and age. Um, Steve, are you able to talk a bit about some of the components of the solution? And also, how flexible is video as a service? Is it a one-size-fits-all approach? 
are we able to to tailor it to an organization based on what they're trying to achieve? Yeah, so uh, I think a couple of important points there. So in general, when, when looking at deployment models, um, we make a big separation between the on-prem and private hosted and, and the public multi-tenant. Uh, the public multi-tenant is, is thought of as a fixed environment with a very... Um, it's a one-size-fits-all, and you either like it or not if it's appropriate for you. The on-prem uh, and, and the hosted, these are highly, I don't want to say highly customized uh, because they're templated, but those are configured based on the user requirements and have lots of um, knobs, as we say, uh, to adjust based on the user requirements. So when customers are looking at the various deployment models and consumption models, there's also the important question of what elements of the solution do they get do they get to control? So that's a, a big difference we're seeing between the public cloud uh, and then the on-prem and the, and the private cloud. When we look at the components, um, what in the move to cloud, one of the important elements is to understand where the TCO is in terms of all the different components and. In general, what we're seeing is, is that in a like-for-like -like service, for the exact same service, over time, cloud is more expensive than on-prem. Um, but when you go through the cloud consolidation process, you gain efficiencies by understanding exactly what you need, right? So the TCO, you do need to look at all the pieces, and I'll get to those in a minute, but by going through that process, you have a much better understanding of what exactly do I need, right? And by consuming it more on a SaaS basis, you're paying for what you're actually using versus taking the risk of buying the large capacity up front, okay? In terms of the actual elements, and, and it's interesting to go through to see... is call control, MCU, um, in the Cisco world we'd have conductor and TMS and call manager, in the Polycom world we'd have DMA and RPM and you know all those all those different pieces. So you have the, the third party um, call control and MCU functions for Polycom, Cisco, Econo and others. The next element if you are looking for an external hosted solution is you have the physical hosting of the, uh, of the equipment in one or more data centers. You've got the professional services um, which work around consulting with the customer to understand what their configuration, what their needs are, and then actually configuring the equipment to, to, meet, to meet those requirements. And then once you're in um, steady state production, you have a series of managed services and monitoring to um, manage and monitor the infrastructure components, uh, whether it's on the customer prem or, or, or it's hosted. You've got um, the actual elements of the service underneath the application, such as the operating system or VMware, those need maintenance, and right? You've got the administration of the maintenance contracts, right, to, to provide um, a, a full service there. Um, and those are the major elements of, of delivery. So you've got the equipment, you've got the hosting, you have uh, professional services, and then on a steady state basis, you have the managed services um, that include the equipment, the operating system, and the platform, and the maintenance contracts for, for what's underneath. Um, I think, again, we look at CapEx and OpEx models um, for these, and um, on, on the on-prem and the private, one of the big differentiating factors when you look at service providers is, is how consumptive are the models and how flexible are they, right? Um, and so those are the elements that, 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 that make up the, uh, the technology solution. Yeah, Steve, I just want to I want to uh, come back to one of your points because it's, it's a really important thing. As you say, the cloud model, and I don't want to to be too light on it, you said the cloud model obviously costs more at the end of the day over time. Absolutely. So, you know, a lot of people said, there's, then why why would people do it? So I just want to emphasize, if you, if you read, you know, the analysts, whether it's Gartner or Ovum, I mean, the CIOs, the CXOs of the company, you know, they see value in this. It's not about saving money. It's about the flexibility of the as-a-service model to allow them to shape their business as they expand or contract. I mean, yeah, and, it, and it's the transfer of the risk profile, right? So, in other right, words, the, risk is the, other, the, right. the big trade-off is, is that with the cloud models, the vendor is taking the risk that the solution is going to work, that it's going to be on time, the service levels, et cetera, et cetera. So the big trade-off is, yeah, like for like cost may be the same, but when you look at the risk profile and the ability to scale, those are the reasons that, that, that cloud is a focus and why um, to, why 
two elements of the business are fo focusing on that. From a line of business perspective, right, they get their solution quickly um, on a predictive cost basis that they can budget for. And then from an IT perspective, there's a significant risk profile reduction in terms of the fact that the vendor is taking the risk on the deployment, the schedule, the patches, the upgrades, the CapEx investment, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so for just to make the point clear, I mean, for example, in a pharmaceutical, some of our pharmaceutical clients, one of them in particular, was able to reduce the amount of time to market with a drug consistently over time. So if they were able to drive out, you know, 10% of the time it takes them to take a drug to market, the cost of a video environment, you know, versus the upside and the market opportunity and the revenues that they drive by getting every drug to market 10% faster than they used to, that's enormous business impact. So I just want to make sure, you know, we, we hit that point that, you know, people think about cost all the time. And, and listen, it is popular to save save money in IT, and, and we want to do that. But this is really about the outcome, the business impact that we can have with these solutions. Yeah, and I, I think... If we look at some of the uh, the data from Gartner, right now we're seeing roughly a 30-70 split in terms of um, budget ownership of line of business owning 30%, IT owning 70. But the prediction right. is is that by 2017, that's going to be a 50-50 split. So right. being able to sell services that are consumptive to lines of business that can be purchased in a predictive way and be turned up and turned down uh, very quickly, that's an important trend that's that's coming uh, to uh, to a theater near you very soon. Right. You made you made some very interesting points, guys. In fact, um, at the beginning of the of the hangouts, I talked about how um, probably reduction in corporate travel costs was one of the key drivers of video conferencing, and probably the most tangible way of justifying the cost of video conferencing. But Jim, you talked about how pharmaceutical clients are using video conferencing to reduce time to market for new products and, and new services, and that's key. Uh, and certainly, whilst the CFO would be keen on on reducing costs. And leveraging video conferencing to, to do that, um, organizations you know, across all industries, not just pharmaceutical, and not only that, but also all lines of business, all departments within an organization, will be keen on improving productivity, on managing complex supply chains, operational efficiencies, things like that. Th these are probably less tangible, uh, but really much more strategic uh, and are really key to, to a competitive edge for an organization. You, you touched upon um, Unilever. Uh, as a way, as an example of, of, of a client that has uh, deployed video as a service. Can you talk a bit about some of the, um, the objectives uh, and ultimately what were they trying to achieve and, and the business outcomes of deploying this kind of solution? Yeah, I, thanks, Doran. Um, yeah, I hit on a, on a few of those earlier in my introduction um, about video as a service. Um, the key metrics, I think, that the Unilever has been um, driving to is that ability anyone to be able to do business anywhere, you know, no matter you know what device or what endpoint or what room they're in, whether in a hotel, whether they're home, whether they're on the road, whatever it is, and and that's really the business driver is that virtual uh, business you know capability, um, and if if you think about that, what it drives is a cultural difference in how they how they perform. It's good for the company because they have more productive people, but it's good for us as individuals because now we can have more time. We don't have to be, you know, I don't have to be in a physical meeting all the time. Now that's foundational to video conferencing, always been a goal, but now Unilever is actually realizing it where they're able to use devices or, 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 or be on, you know, Skype for business or, you know, any of these pieces and conduct their, their business. Um, so that, that said, another piece that just is a byproduct of that, another cost savings, think about it. They're able to now have people working from wherever. Uh, their goal was to drive from a five-day work week in the office to a one-day work week for their employees over time. That's not, you know, that's over the next, you know, five years. Um, so, but think about it, the real estate impact. So they're building their, their offices now with offices for activities, right? For, you know, so you have offices that multiple people use. So the amount of real estate alone that they're saving, you know, is tens of millions of dollars in, in the cost of real estate. That's just a byproduct of that. 
Um, now, if you go back to what else have they impacted in the company, uh, within the first three months of the as a video as a service model that we've delivered to them, uh, some of the metrics that they gave us, uh, we don't have the latest ones, but the first three months, they were able to avoid 25,000 uh, 25, yeah, million miles in air travel. Um, they were able to reduce their carbon footprint by 7.3 million tons. Um, they saved over $3 million um, in travel costs. Um, and and another, another way to interpret that, you know, that, that they put this together and they promoted this internally, they've saved enough carbon, um, you know, to save 16,500 hectares of rainforest. You know, they, they've saved enough to, you know, have 55 round trips to the moon. That's pretty cool. Um, and, and it's given, the ultimate is they've given 84,000 hours back to their employees. So again, that factor, that culture change, it's, 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 it's just it's, it's pervasive through the company due to what the technologies are allowing them to do. So it's far beyond technology. It's far beyond, you know, it's how they conduct their businesses different than they've ever, ever done. And they're realizing their outcomes by allowing people to work from wherever, uh, whenever they want to. Fantastic. So this is certainly not just about <clears throat> reducing uh, corporate travel costs. Of course, that's that's an important part of it. But it's very much about the culture um, and changing the way they do business, changing the way uh, and improving the work-life balance for, for their colleagues as well. Exactly. Great. So my final question, Jim. Um, what are the takeaways now? So, you know, an organization who either is starting their journey to video conferencing or, uh, on the other hand, a mature uh, adopter of video conferencing, what would you recommend would be the next steps? How can you either maximize your investment or assist people to take that first step? Do you have a kind of a three-point or a four-point plan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would just uh, listen. Uh, you know, there's a lot of a lot of things you could say what you should do next steps. You can make a list of, of a thousand things. But to break it down really simply, um, number one, um, Get to know the technologies that are in the market. Understand what they can do for you versus, especially if you have a lot of old kit that you're spending a lot of money on and it's limiting your experience. You know, see what's out there. You know, talk to your partners, whatever it is. Understand what those technologies are, what they can do to impact your environment. Then go create a vision of what that experience you want to create for your enterprise. Then, you know, once you have that vision, then based on that vision, number two is to identify what outcomes you want to create with that. You know, again, Unilever, they wanted to create an agile work workplace and, you know, give back to their employees at the same time, extend their business, grow their business. Uh, and then thirdly, you know, really important is to align yourself with a trusted partner, someone who you know, know understands the technologies as well as can align with your business outcomes. Listen, there's a lot of good technology people, smart technologists out there. This is not only about this. This is primarily about how do you en enable your business processes and experience through that technology. So it's, 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 um, it's not just a technology partner that you're looking for. So those would be the three things I'd, I'd say to take away uh, at, a, at the highest level. Great. Jim, Steve, thank you so much for your time. It's been a really, really informative, really interesting conversation. Uh, thank you all for participating and joining us in today's Google Hangouts. To find out more, you can go to dimensiondata.com forward slash visualcoms. Thank you and have a great day. Okay, thanks.